Share it right now. Yeah. Yeah, is that on? I'm not sure how to turn that on. <laughs> Go ahead. Come on up, Shirley. Should be green, right? Okay. No, uh, Dan's testimony it speaks to all of us. You know, uh, I've been spending a lot of time living in the past, you might say, recalling all my memories and going through my treasure chest and finding treasures and thinking what all the people that have touched my life over 90 years and oh God is so good. You've got a lot to look forward to. 90 is a wonderful age to be when you have the Lord and he just blesses you every minute. And, uh, but I, uh, I did go back uh, many years ago when my mother was alive and for those of you who knew her, uh, she was a pretty special lady, and she wrote poems herself, but she would read poems at church, and they were such a blessing, and she read this one at church many years ago, and I found it in my treasure chest, and it means more to me now than ever, and I wanted to share it with you, and, uh, you know, people think they're going to get good, and then they come to God. But Jesus said, only God is good, and you've got to come to Jesus to get to God to get good. So you don't, that doesn't work. We can try as hard as we can to be good and to do everything perfect, but there's no perfect until we get to heaven. And, uh, but this is just a special poem, and I'd like to share it with you. It's called The Temple of My Heart. I swept the temple of my heart and cleaned it everywhere. I, I dusted every corner and made it sweet and fair. I brushed down all the cobwebs and polished every pane. I, <coughs> I varnished all the paneling and, and scoured every stain. And then I opened wide the doors and asked the master in. I said, my heart is all prepared and cleansed from every sin. But when he took his samples off and crossed the polished floor, I saw a hundred horrid stains I had not seen before. He stood and looked around him with a frown upon his face, and I heard his murmur softly, this is not a fitting place. The pictures that are hanging upon the temple wall are not the scenes I cherish. Come, let us change them all. And as I took my pictures down with many a sigh and tear, for they were precious memories I had cherished many a year. There were scenes of pain and passion, of, of pomp and power and, and pride. And then the master painted a field. And, and I, excuse me, I loosed them from their fastenings and cast them all aside. And then the master painted a field of ripening grain, the golden sheaves laid scattered across the rolling plains. And he stooped and wrote beneath it in the letters straight and true, the harvest is as plenteous and the laborers are few. <clears throat> Inside the lighted window where the sun was shining in, he hung the anguished beauty of that woman found in sin. And while he knelt in penitence, he wrote across the floor, neither as I condemn thee, go thou and sin no more. He found the secret chamber where I often knelt in prayer and hung the dazzling splendor of the crucifixion there. And in the darkened corridors, amidst, sha amidst shadows dim and gray, he placed the flaming glory of the resurrection day. Amen. But still, he wasn't satisfied. He crossed the polished floor 
and saw beneath the stairway a little secret door and found when he opened it the dusty shelves within were were crowded full of filthiness and little secret sins the things that I had coveted the source of my desires the the net of my passions flo floating with fierce, unholy fires. The, the words that I had spoken that were neither kind or true, that task that I neglected, the work I ought to do. And there among the rubbish was a bargain I had made that wasn't strictly, uh, it wasn't strictly honest. It, in its interest that it had paid at a, excuse my, my eyes here, um, a bent and broken fellowship and another broken tool that I neglected shamefully, the dear old golden rule. Then while I stood before him, my face suffused with shame, I heard him murmur softly and sorrowfully my name. And as he turned away from me as if he would depart, I cried, Oh, blessed Master, come thou and cleanse my heart. And then he laid his sandals by and took the easy chair while I burned upon the altars the sweet incense of prayer. And still he stays stays with me, nor, nor hastens to depart, for when he has cleansed and purified the temple of my heart. I, I wish I could have done a better job of reading that, but is it not true? You know, every day he finds something more to clean. He said, open up this door, you know. I am praying for God that God has given me opportunity to witness to my my grandchildren and I I just am so grateful before I die that I can reach all of them and I want to write them a letter and my thoughts are the temple of our heart. Within us each there's a door. And on that door, there's a doorknob, and it's on the inside, and only we can open that door. And only we know whether we open that door. You know, we might live a life that looks good. We might live a life praising God and loving Him. And I think, yes, I think we can see Christ in those. That I see them in you. I see Christ in you. But if, if we don't open that door and say, open come in and help me clean up this mess. You know, that's the only way we can get cleaned up is for Jesus to come and do it in us and for us and through us. And he's so wonderful, and he really is. He never leaves you or forsakes you. He's there every moment, every moment of everything we need in you know, all of our, our living. And, and uh, I, I, I hope that blessed you. You know, I was thinking about, you were apologizing for your reading. You don't have glasses on. Yeah. 90 years old, surely. Your eyes are beautiful. <laughs> you don't have contacts. You, oh, you're, you're st do you realize that I can't read anything of that? I mean, when I take glasses off, it's just blurry. I mean, God is blessed. <laughs> yeah.
Amen. Wow. <laughs> You wake up at 3.30 and you feel the Lord's presence. <laughs> you know why. <laughs> Surely he's praying. And uh, I'm just thankful for it. <laughs> I know, she was. <laughs> I love <it. laughs> oh. Well, let's just, uh, let's just give this time to the Lord. Um, we were singing that song earlier that I thought just... This is my story. This is my song. It's a declaration. Um, I had a friend years ago, and every time I hear that song, I, I think of people. But I, I think of him. Uh, Lindsey Killian was his name. Some of you know him. But uh, he was singing that song, and, and that was his moment of conversion. Um, but the Lord's presence come upon him. And he, he, he knew, he would talk about this, he would say, that was my story. It became my story in that song. And I just, uh, beautiful. Just pray that is all of your stories. That's kind of what this, this message is about, uh, that it would be your story. Let's just pray. Father, I, I do. I just praise and I thank you for your goodness to us, your faithfulness. And Lord, this, uh, this life, with all of its ups and its downs, its beauty and its ugliness, I it's, it's all leading to one thing, one place, and that's when face to face, your son we see. And I thank you and I praise you for that. And I pray that our hearts would be yearning, longing, ready for that moment, that day. Amen. Well, if you want to turn to, uh, I'm going to be jumping around a little bit, but uh, Mark chapter 13 is kind of where I want to begin today. We've been kind of doing, a, we were going through the, the book of Corinthians, and we came to chapter 15, and we began to talk about the resurrection. And uh, I thought, you know, this is a good time to really to begin to talk about uh, the resurrection, millennium, Christ's return. So last week, we looked at Christ's return through Zechariah 14, and I just want to kind of wrap up my thoughts on the second return today um, with, a, with a couple of thoughts. Uh, I was driving home... Uh, 10 days ago, I guess it was, on a Wednesday night from a farewell uh, you know, going away party for three workers from a mine from India that were, were let go. And uh, so I was, um, was kind of mourning about that, and, and uh, I was driving home, but I began to reflect on the, the second return and began to ask the Lord for what, what his heart was, what he would want me to share. And these three things came to my mind in quick succession. And so I, I want to speak on it. I, I, I sense that he was sharing this with me. But may you be found watching. May you be found ready. And most importantly, may you be found in love. Above all else, may you be found in love. So I want to take a look at that and begin to unpack that a little bit today. And so uh, that first that the Lord wants us to be found watching. He wants us to be, to be found alert. Mark 13 uh, in verse 37, it just sums that up uh, beautifully, where Jesus says, And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. What I say to you, and that, that's plural, and that's speaking about those who were in his presence that day, his disciples. But then he says, not only am I speaking to you, but I say this to all, and that all encompasses all those that, are, that would include us. And his words of instruction to us is, stay awake. Now, when I begin to reflect on this, uh, this thought this week, and I begin to, to, to meditate on the passages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in particular, and what I found was that there is, Jesus put in a lot of emphasis on this, this idea of, of being awake, being alert, um, watching. Those three concepts are, are synonyms. I came to, to, hey, you know, he's really speaking about one and the same thing. Be alert, be awake, be watching for, for my coming. Um, so the greater passage here, 
in, in Mark chapter 13. I want to begin in verse 32, and then let's just listen to Jesus, listen to his words. He says, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know what time will, when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and he puts his servants in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the roast rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, Stay awake. This, this emphasis that he, he puts on this, this idea of being alert. You know, Luke in particular, I, I find it interesting that in Luke chapter 12, again in Luke 17, and then again in Luke 21, Jesus brings out this thought of be alert, be awake, be watching for my, my coming. Um, Jesus puts a lot of emphasis on this, this idea. And, and I find that what... Jesus never puts emphasis on things that aren't extremely important. He, he's voicing this because he wants us to, to be alert. He wants us to be a, awake and watching for his coming. And each of the Gospels brings a slightly different angle, but, but it's obviously something that Jesus taught a lot. You know, when Jesus would go from town to town preaching and sharing the Gospel, um, you see this... In, in the Gospels, where he'll, he'll preach something very similar in different uh, segments of his, his ministry. And uh, he's obviously sharing this again and again and again. He's putting a lot of emphasis on this idea of, of the coming and to be alert, to be awake. So this is, this is something of an emphasis. It's important to our Lord, and it ought to be important to us. And he compares, Mark does, uh, Jesus is speaking and he compares himself to a lord of a house who goes on this long journey. And the master gives instructions to each one of his servants. To each is given a job. To each is given a responsibility. The, the charge of his household, his, of his, which is a, um, a picture of his kingdom, is shared. And each one of us is to play a part in that in that taking care of, in that watching, in that being alert. None of us are without a role or a job. And so um, he urges us to be, to be alert, to be looking. In 1 Thessalonians, um, Paul writes, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. You're not, you're not in darkness. That day should not come upon you um, like a thief and unawares. Now, Jesus in this passage in particular, he calls out this idea that concerning that day or that hour, um, no one knows. No one knows. There's been a lot of energy and, and uh, I think wasted energy in a lot of ways in church history looking and trying to figure out what day or hour Christ is going to return. And I, th I think that's a wrong emphasis. Um, that's, that's it's not our right to know. It's not our right to know. Our responsibility and our job is to be alert, to be watch, to be wait. Those are the three things. That, that's, our, that's our responsibility. And so um, don't be concerned about the day or the hour of which, which he's returning. Um, we don't know the day or hour, but you know what? That day doesn't have to be a surprise. Uh, and, and I want to just elaborate on that a little bit because I believe that there are, um, there will be notification, there will be signs, but not what you think that they're going to be. So let's continue this thought. So in Luke chapter 12 and verse 35, Jesus um, says, stay dressed for action. Uh, I love that, that phrase. It, it literally, the, in, in the Greek, it just means Keep your loins girded. Keep ready for battle. Keep ready for action. I mean, so you're, it's nighttime. 
but, but you're ready for the fight, you know? And, and he, he, he continues that thought and he says, keep your lamps burning. And, and I, 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 my thoughts go to the, the 10 virgins, remember that um, 10 lights, five of them had gone out, right? And so, but his, again, it's that same idea, that same thought, keep the life the oil in your lamps, the, the Spirit of God, His life in you, keep it burning. Do not let it go out. Keep alert. Keep watch. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third, and he finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have not left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. That, that word in that, he says, blessed are those, and be like men who are waiting for their master. There's, it's looking forward to, it, it's, it, it's with anticipation. It's not just keeping an eye on something. It's eagerly awaiting something, the master's return. And there's something very un, unusual and, and striking in this passage. Because when a master would come home, especially from a long journey, um, the idea would be that they would be exhausted and tired and hungry. And they would come and immediately um, prepare for me some food, uh, something to drink, prepare my bed, prepare, you know, to, to serve. Do, do you notice what the master comes and, and he says, blessed are those servants whom I find watching and waiting for me, who immediately at once open the door. I mean, I don't have to knock, 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 and, and someone groggily, you know, stumble to the door and open up. Oh, it's, it's the master. Um, but do you notice what, what Jesus says the master does? He will dress for himself for service. He takes the servant's role. It should be the servant that's preparing for the master. But Jesus is saying on that day, he as our Lord and Master are going to, is going to be preparing a meal for us, blessing us. And it's, it's this incredible honor that he puts, and it, it's especially for those who are watching and waiting. And uh, I want to talk a little bit as we develop this thought about the marriage supper of the Lamb. But I think he's speaking about this, this, this marriage service that, that's to come. And uh, his service to, to those, his servants who are found faithful. So the question that I have in this, and maybe you have the same, but what are we waiting for? What are we watching for? What are we looking specifically for? We're, we're, you know, we're, we're supposed to be watching. And in general, we're watching for his return. Um, but is there something else that we need to be watching for too? Right? And and I've, I've heard a lot of people speak on this, and there's all kinds of ideas. Okay, we need to be watching for this. We need to be watching for that. We need to watch. And I'm going to give a little different slant here, because I, I, don't think, I don't think it's quite what, what we, we ought to be watching for. Um, so I want to go to the first coming. To, and I, I believe there are parallels that where Jesus' first coming is, is there's some parallels to his second coming. So I want to take a look at those because these were blessing me and I, I want to share them with you and bless, hopefully bless you too. But in Luke chapter 2, remember I told, told you that Luke is the one that emphasizes most the, the coming, the watching, the waiting, the anticipating our Lord's return. Chapter 12, again in chapter 17, again in chapter 21. Well, in Luke chapter 2, we read about Christ's first coming. And in Luke chapter 8, I mean chapter 2 and verse 8, it talks about the shepherds in the field. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. 
That watch is the same word that Jesus uses again and again and again for watching for his coming. And so it's late at night, um, probably the second or third watch of the night, which would be, you know, the, the night was divided into four watches of three hours each. And, and those second and third watches are the, the, the really difficult ones to stay awake when after midnight to three, especially that third watch. So the shepherds are awake and they're watching. It says that they were in the field looking after their flock at night. And in that moment, um, God gives them a revelation of his son's birth. And, and so continuing in Luke chapter 2 and verse 9, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. What should notice that? You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The question that I have is, when were the shepherds given a sign? immediately when they needed it. Not before. It was at that moment, and it was at that time. And, and so the, the sign came when they needed it, but not a minute before. <laughs> and it, it's just interesting that they were just going about their duty, their job, and they were being faithful to that job. They were watching and caring for the, the, the sheep. And they didn't know that this was going to be any different than any other night. But on that night... Our Lord was born, and, and the Lord showed up. And they were given, they were given that sign right at that moment. We'll continue on in, in Luke chapter 2. At day 8, um, Jesus was taken to the temple to be uh, circumcised, and an offering be made there for, for a, a, the firstborn child. And in Luke chapter 2 and verse 25, it says, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and his, this man was righteous and devout. And he was, and look at this word, it's the same word that appears again and again and again. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. Do you see the Simeon, this man who had been given a word from the Lord that he was going to get to see the Messiah come. And he was going to get to... But, but do you notice when he was given the sign? When was he told of the Lord's coming? It was, he, was, he, he was brought in the Spirit into the temple. It was the Holy Spirit drawing him in that moment. And uh, so he had been waiting, and he'd been waiting for the consolation of Israel. But it was in that moment when the Holy Spirit revealed to him, drew him into the temple to, 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 to receive and to see all that his heart had been wanting and anticipating and waiting for. Again, it's that, it's that, it was in that moment. Continuing in Luke chapter 2 and verse 36 to 38, it says, Now that there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, and she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting and praying day and night. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. 
There was a, a lot of people that were waiting, anticipating, looking, longing for the coming of Messiah. And this woman, Anna, who day and night, from the time that she was, she's 84 years old, and she, it was seven years after she was married that she became a widow. They, they, they married quite young. So, I mean, you're talking about early 20s, you know, 23 or so. She had been in the temple day and night. That This was her longing, her heart, for 60 years. Longing, waiting for the coming of Messiah. And she says that she w was a prophetess. And she heard from the Lord that day. And she begins to declare to all those that were gathered who were also waiting for the Lord's coming. But I, I want you to point out, she'd been waiting a long time faithfully, 60 years. But on this moment, on this day, she was given a word, a prophetic word in that moment, a revelation from God that the Messiah was here. The Messiah was here. And she shared that. And, but again, no real advance warning, right? So here's where, where I'm driving with this, is that the point is, I don't think that we're going to be given a whole lot of advance warning. I think it's going to be in that moment, in that, that, that day, not a whole lot before, maybe a couple of days before. And, and, and the sign that of the Lord's coming is going to be a spiritual sign. The sign will be really the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart that Messiah is here, Messiah is nigh. There will be a, a stirring in your heart. And you'll begin to, you know, to, to yearn and to long in ways that you, you never before had. That's the drawing. I want us to live in, the, in that reality because so often we try to look for signs. That, well, when this occurs, when this occurs, maybe when this. And, and I think really our role is to be faithful like Anna, decade after decade after decade, but always yearning, always looking, always waiting. And the Lord will reveal himself. He, you, it will not be a surprise to you because the Lord will reveal to the faithful in that moment, but not, not before you need. <laughs> so, I hope that encourages you in this way. He will be faithful to, to let us know, though. And so, this, this may you be found watching. That, that's my prayer for us, that we would be found a people watching. But may you also be found ready. May you be found ready. In Luke chapter 21, again, Luke is bringing out this thought of the coming of our Lord. And, but he takes a little bit different angle here in this, these verses. And I want just to call this out. In verse 34, he says, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Do you see what Jesus says? Watch yourselves. He says, but watch yourselves. So he's not... In this case, you know, he says, yes, be watching for my coming, but he's also wanting us to be watching. There's a plural there. And, and, that, and that verb in the Greek, it's plural. And the yourselves is plural. It says, you all be watching you all, is the, the context. You, be, be on the lookout for any that may be slipping away, that may be sliding into dissipation and drunkenness or, or getting so burdened and, with the cares of this life that it's just crushing their faith. There's a sense in which the readiness, we're ready in community. Don't try to be a lone ranger on this one. I, 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 this, this has really become evident to me. You know, I, I tend to be more of a lone ranger type. And the Lord speaking... Don't you dare be a lone ranger in this day. You can't afford to be. Because it's in community that we wait. It's in community that we watch. It's, 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 it's in community that we keep one another alert and awake and prepared and, and ready for our Lord's coming. 
And, and so that, in verse 36, but stay awake, that's, that's plural, but you all stay awake, praying, again, it's plural, that you, plural, may have strength, and that have strength, the verb is plural. So there's a sense in which we are, as the community of God, uh, as disciples of our Lord Jesus, we stay awake together, we pray together, we have strength together, so that we may have strength to escape together and to stand before the Son of Man together as his beautiful bride. We, we, we stay awake in community. We watch in community. We won't get to that day in safety without one another. We, we need one another to be ready. That, that watching, there's two categories of things that we need to be looking out for. One is dissipation and drunkenness. Dissipation, I had to look that up because I, uh, I wanted to see what that, the concept was in the Greek. And, and it, it really is, it has to do with drunkenness as well. And, and it, in the sense of it's, it's the party life. It's the party lifestyle. It's the party attitude. And so you could almost think of the dissipation is the attitude, the drunkenness is the act. But it's, 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 it's looking for a refuge, for shelter in, in drinking and partying. And, you know, it's, it's looking for refuge there. But on the other end of the spectrum is another danger. And that danger is the cares of life, the anxieties, the worries of life, all the things that tend to sap all of our joy and to, you know, to, to, to take away our, our, our happiness and our hope. So when we see a brother or sister and they begin to, to flounder in their faith and they begin to fall into either dissipation, and there's, there's many different categories of, of dissipation, and, and, but there's also many different categories of being weighed down with the cares of life. But we're to come alongside them and encourage one another all the more as we see that day approaching. Let they not be alone in their struggle. Let us come alongside and strengthen them. In Revelation chapter 19, there's the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I, I've, been, I've gone to here a couple of times in recent weeks, and, and I want to go there again. It's just been, it's been resonating in my heart. But in verse 6, it says, Then I heard, and this is the angel, no, this is John speaking here, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Do you see how she prepared and made herself ready? She was dressed in holiness. She was dressed in righteousness. But it had been granted to her. It had been given to her the righteousness with which she was to dress. It's a gift. Your righteousness in Christ is a gift, but that gift has to be put on. It cannot be just given and not. You have to dress yourself with his righteousness. And, and I, I want to bring out this, this thought in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. It, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Strive for holiness without which no one, no one will see the Lord. No one will be there that does not have the righteousness of Christ dressed. Unless you're dressed in his righteousness, you're not going to be there. There's this, do you remember the, the, the Jesus' parable about the wedding feast? 
There was one man that was there, and the master of the feast came to him and said, where is your wedding garments? And the man was speechless, and he was cast out from the wedding. You know, you, to understand that, but in a, in a, in a, a royal rich wedding, Wedding garments were provided by the master for all of his guests. All you had to do was put it on. It's free. But you had to put it on. And, and, and the, uh, there's this emphasis is without holiness, no one will see the Lord. No one is going to be there unless there is a commitment to, to, to holiness. And, and I don't want you to be off put of that in terms of like legalism and now I got to go go out and get holy but uh, that holiness has been granted to you the, the garments have been given to you in Christ Jesus but make sure you're wearing them you know, make sure you've got those garments on and that you you keep them without soil without stain because that is what the Lord is looking for in his bride which he's coming for so the third part you know, my prayer is that we'd be found watching, that we'd be ready, but above all else, I believe the Lord would have us to be in love. In Second Timothy, as, as Paul comes to the end of his life, he shares his heart with his spiritual son. And this is a word of encouragement for, for Timothy. It's in a word of encouragement for many, many believers throughout 2,000 years. But verse 6, he writes, for I have already, am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the fight, good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but look at this, to all those who have loved his appearing. Paul longed for, he was in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and he longed for that day. And Paul is saying that on that day, all those who is a love his appearing are going to be rewarded the crown of righteousness will be theirs. But, you know, you can't love his appearing unless you're in love with the one who's appearing. <laughs> it's just, we're called to be in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. I think about that being the bride of Christ. The church is his bride. I cannot imagine a bride not being loved. It's not right. It's just not right. If we are the bride of Christ, then we, we have to be in love with the bridegroom, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, to, to not be in love with him tragedy and a travesty it, it's, it's, it's just not the way it was meant to be my prayer is that we would be continually growing and deepening in our love for the Lord Jesus Christ that's my prayer for myself, it's my prayer for you the Song of Solomon Song of Solomon I, it's always been a difficult uh, passage for me you know, in terms of book and because I, I've always wondered, why is that book in, in Scripture? <laughs> it's a beautiful love story, but, but you know, it's like, why? I, when I began to look at church history and study church history, I, you know, it was apparent, very, very apparent, that two, 20 centuries, 2,000 years of saints have read the Song of Solomon and have seen a story, a telling of the bride of Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ. A love story between Christ and his bride, the church. And uh, I began to go back and to reread it with that mindset because, so who is who's more likely to be wrong? You know, 
uh, me or 20 centuries of <laughs> was, I began to read it that way and it began to bless me and I began to um, it, so let me just share a pa- um, in second I mean Sol- Song of Psalms chapter 2 verses 8 to 13 the voice of my beloved this is the bride speaking behold he comes Behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks. And he says to me, arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, and the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land, the fig tree ripens its figs, and the vines are in blossom, and they give forth fragrance. And again we read, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. Those are the words that I think Christ is wanting to share with his bride. Arise and come away with me. There's coming a, a day, and that day is going to, like I say, it won't have a lot of annou- announcement. I don't believe it's going to come with, uh, <laughs> suddenly upon us all. But that trumpet is going to sound, and Christ is going to appear And he's going to be looking to catch away his bride to himself. And there's that, arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away with me. Looking at, I think Jesus is going to catch away his bride from the earth. He's going to take her to to heaven. The, The marriage supper of the Lamb in chapter 19 occurs in heaven. And when I try to get my mind around that, um, you know, there's like 2.4, they say, billion Christians on planet Earth. And I don't know how many of those are, you know, the Spirit of God dwells within them, that they, they have a true and saving relationship with, with Jesus Christ. I don't know. It's not mine to know. But I do know that through 2,000 years of history and all the saints before the first coming of Christ, you're talking about billions of people that have loved the Lord and long for his appearing. It's going to be a big wedding. <laughs> it's going to be mind-boggling how glorious. You know, the angels in Revelation, it talks about their myriad, myriads upon myriads. It's myriads multiplied by myriads. A myriad was a, a, a 10,000. So 10,000 10, times 10,000 is 100 million. That would be myriad upon myriad. But myriads upon myriads is hundreds of millions of angels in heaven. They're going to be there gathered in celebration. And, and you know, it, it's, it's this glorious event, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's, it's like, it's hard to get your mind around being there, not only just being there as a guest, but being there as the bride of Christ. Wow. So I just want to close with Revelation 19 again. And this, this hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. She's She's ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is that righteous deeds of the same. And the angel said to me, write this. Write this. Take note of this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Did you know that's all of you? (laughs) 
Each one of us has an invitation from the Lord himself to be there, to be a part of that wedding feast. I don't want to miss it. And I don't want you to miss it. And I, I want us to, to be ready and to be watching and to be in love. Above all, to be in love. You know, I close with this thought. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 9. Most of us know that Revelation 21 is, is New Jerusalem coming down as a bride from heaven. It, there's a, there's a, a phrase here that I, I love. It's in chapter 21 and verse 9. And the angel tells John, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Come. He takes him to an exceedingly high mountain. He says, Let me show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Did you know that throughout New Testament, it, there's, there's, it speaks of us as the church being the bride of Christ. Did you know that there's only one place in all scripture that speaks of us as being his wife? It's Revelation 21 and verse 9. You know why? Because the marriage supper of the Lamb has taken a place. And he comes, Christ does, with his bride, his beautiful bride, to the Mount of Olives where he takes his Stand, where he enters through the eastern gate into Jerusalem. You know, a, a bride of billions <laughs> who are coming in, on white horses behind him, dressed in, in bright and beautiful white linen. That is some procession. It's going to take hours and hours <laughs> for all to come. And to... I, I just marvel at that. I, I love that. I hope, I hope that your heart stirs <laughs> with joy as, as we share this. But let, let, us, let us always be watching. Let us always be faithful. Let us be ready for that day. And let us make sure that others are ready too. That's part of love, is, is to look and to see others that are waning, come alongside them and make sure that they're ready for that day. But above all else, this is my prayer for myself, it's my prayer for you, is that we would be in love. That we would be in love with the bride and the groom. Yeah. Let's pray. Oh, what a day. I... I long for that day. I yearn for it. It's with eager anticipation that I, I dream. I pray that you would plant a, such a vivid dream in each one of our hearts and each one of our lives. We would never be at home in this earth. Because the desire and the dream and the longing for our Lord's coming, let that always be the yearning and the focal point of our lives through the dark seasons, through the suffering, through the death, through the sorrow. Let that be the North Star, your love, shining through our hearts, our longing for your coming. I just praise you for your faithfulness because it's in your faithfulness that I trust and I abide. Amen.